Hey guys, welcome to our service. I'm so glad that you're tuning in today. If you didn't know, Church on the Move is a family of churches. We have three locations across Northeast Oklahoma. So if you live near one of our locations, come out and join us in person. We have incredible worship and teaching, and of course, amazing environments for kids and students that we want you and your family to experience for yourselves. If you have questions, you can drop a comment below or visit churchonthemove.com for more info. Now enjoy the service. Well, good morning, Church on the Move West. We are starting a brand new series today. We are jumping into the book of Proverbs. I've had so many people tell me, there we go. Yeah, I've had so many people tell me, man, we're excited about the book of Proverbs. We can't wait to dive into this. It's, I, I've had people say it's my favorite book. I, I don't know what your experience is. I don't know if you spent any time reading Proverbs or not. I, I can tell you my experience, why I'm excited about this series is Proverbs, I, I can tell you it's the first book of the Bible that I remember being drawn to, that as a, as a middle school kid, as a high school kid who was, was becoming serious about my faith, about trying to make my faith my own, and I knew a part of that was reading the Bible, that I needed to be spending time doing that, I remember that I, I kind of was drawn to reading the book of Proverbs because I could read it and, and I could kind of in its simplicity understand what was going on. I didn't have to know the narrative of scripture. I didn't have to know the historical context. I didn't have to understand the theology of a Pauline epistle, right? I didn't have to know all these kinds of things about reading the Bible. I could just go to these short, little, concise statements that seemed to make sense to me and that seemed to apply to uh, what was actually happening in my life. And so I could read something like as iron sharpens iron, you know, so one friend makes another one better. And I could go, okay, what kind of friends do I have in my life? Because this tells me that I need to have good friends. I need to have friends that make me better and not worse. And so I need to choose wisely who I'm surrounding myself with. I, I could read something like a brother is born in a time of adversity and I could say, okay, I'm going to go through some moments in life that are difficult, that are hard, and I'm not looking forward to those moments, but I know that when they come, something that, that's good is going to come out of that and that is I'm going to know who's with me. Who loves me? Who cares for me? Who can I trust? I'm going to find who's actually the, the person I want close to me in those difficult, difficult moments. I, I could read it as a teenager, and I could look ahead into life. I could, I, could, I could get wisdom for the future. I knew that it's better to live alone on the corner of a roof than with a nagging and complaining wife. That's what Proverbs says. I didn't say it, okay? So don't get mad at me. You can go find it in Proverbs. What do I do with that? I go, okay. Well, I guess who I choose to date and, and who I'm looking at to marry, uh, I should look for somebody who builds me up, who encourages me, who, who helps me, who's going to bring me life and not the opposite of all those things. I could, I could read Proverbs that made me laugh, like as a dog returns to its vomit, so a fool returns to his folly. And at first you're like, that's funny, it says vomit. But then you're like, wait a minute. What's, what's the picture happening here? The picture is, oh, there are, some, there are some bad habits and some dumb things that I return to in my life over and over again. And if I don't want to be a fool, then, then I, I should change some of these patterns in my life. I, I, I could look ahead at parenting and say, okay, if I raise up a child in the way that they should go, uh, then they're going to stay on this path of following the Lord. That, that it, that's part of my job as a parent of raising kids. Oh, that's what my parents are trying to do. That's why they instill these things within me. And so I could, I could read these little uh, bits of wisdom for everyday life. It, and I know that I wasn't even beginning to scratch the surface <laughs> of the depth of the book of Proverbs, and that's why we're going to spend as a church 11 weeks just in the book of Proverbs, and I promise we're just going to be at the top of the well of the depth and the wisdom that comes out of this book, the, the meaning that we can, we can find in it. And this book is all about wisdom. The Hebrew word is chokmah. And in fact, 39 times it, it uses that word wisdom over and over and over. It's about gaining wisdom. It's about getting wisdom. It's about finding wisdom, holding on to it in your 
life. That is the purpose, uh, the meaning, the, the drive behind this book. And, and this book is kind of laid out that there are these short little statements. That's two-thirds of the book. It starts in chapter 10. But the first actual nine chapters of Proverbs is all this introduction into this idea of wisdom. Uh, this introduction to the idea that, that you need wisdom and, and how you gain wisdom. And, and so when we read through those chapters, what we find is this picture uh, of a father sitting down with his son and saying, Son, uh, I want to introduce you to wisdom. Uh, Son, there's something that you need to know about in life. And and the father actually refers to wisdom. It's this personification. He refers to wisdom as Lady Wisdom. Now, men, notice it's not Mr. Wisdom. I'm going to let you draw your own conclusions on why that is. But he says, Hey, Lady Wisdom... She's here, she's available, you need to listen to her voice. And if you do, life will go well for you. And if you don't, it will not. So, so choose to be wise, choose to listen to her. It's this beautiful picture, it's this inviting picture for us. But then if we stop and pause on that for a moment, we can think about the implications of, of what's going on there. Of, okay, that's, that's, that's great. Wisdom is this thing outside of us that's available, that we have access to, that we can grasp. Well, well what that means, if I do a little bit of reasoning here, is I go, oh, well, that means that I do not have wisdom, evidently, Right? That means that I am not the source of wisdom. You are not the source of wisdom. Sorry if that's groundbreaking news to you this morning. You, in and of yourself, are not the source of wisdom. The picture that Proverbs gives us, it is something outside of us that we have the ability to to get, to receive, to fill ourselves up with. But it does not inherently start with us. If you're a parent... You know this and you understand this, right? Because what are you doing with your children? You're trying to teach them how to live, how to to do wise things, to make good decisions, uh, to go on a path that's going to help them and not hurt them. And and I'm stepping into the territory of how do I parent a teenager? We're a few years into this at the Isaac household. And and when it comes to parenting a teenager, there are some things that are non-negotiables, right? Like, I'm still the parent, you're still the child, I'm going to tell you what to do in some areas, right? Church, it's a non-negotiable. You're going to go to church, I don't care if you want to, I don't care about your opinions on the matter, you're going to go to church, right? Because this is something that you need to do. Now, for a moment, let me just say, if you serve in 180, or even for my younger kids, if you serve in Kids on the Move, thank you, because my kids love coming to church. It's never been a fight in our house to this point. Uh, In fact, I made one mad this morning because I wouldn't bring her to all three services this weekend. And so thank you for those who serve and create incredible environments for my kids to love church. But that's a non-negotiable for us. You're going to take a shower. That's a non-negotiable, right? You smell. I don't want to smell it in my house. We're going to do this daily, right? You're going to respect mom in our house. We don't, there's no debate around this. You will show respect to mom. Uh, but then you start to get into some areas that are a little more gray. Let's just say hypothetically that my daughter likes boys, right? Let's just say that she's ready to date boys. And I know as a parent that I can say, here's, here's you know, you can't do this, you can't do this. But I also know that She's, she has free will, right? And at some point, she can do whatever she wants to do. And so what do I try to do instead? I say, hey, let me, let me teach you some things. L- let me tell you what I've learned from, from dating and from getting married. Uh, let me tell you things that, that would be helpful and beneficial that you should do. And let me tell you things that you shouldn't do. And, and I give her wisdom and I give her direction. But there has to come some point when you let your child make decisions. And, and even sometimes make decisions that you're like, I don't think that's going to go well, right? I don't think that's the decision that I, I would have made, but let me help you in this process. Let me help you learn from this so you can become more and more wise. This is what Proverbs says in, in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 7. I think it's one of the funniest verses in the Bible. It says this. It says, the beginning of wisdom is this. Get wisdom. <laughs> and you're like, did we skip a few steps there? Right, Solomon, did we leave some stuff out? Because that's not very helpful to me. What do you mean the beginning is to just get it? It's like if you bought furniture from Ikea and the first step was just a picture of the thing done. And you're like, wait a minute, but how do I, 
how do I get from all this being in pieces to get to there? But he, but he says, if it costs you everything, if you have to give up everything that you have, do it to get understanding. He's talking about the importance of wisdom, that it is something that we have to have. We have to put it as a value in our life, that we have to do whatever it takes to get wisdom, that, that we have to submit to this thing that God has made available for us. And think about the, the story of Scripture from the beginning. As God creates the heavens and the earth, he, he creates the Garden of Eden. He places Adam and Eve into the garden. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. My, my family, we took our kids to the, the gathering place yesterday. I don't know if you ever go there, but they've planted all of these like natural plants all over, and it was just so green. It was just sprouting up everywhere. It's like it, it, that doesn't even stretch the surface of how lush and beautiful the garden would have been that Adam and Eve live in. And he says, hey, look, all of this is yours. It, it, Except there's this tree, uh, we call it the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In the Hebrew, it's literally, it's the tree of knowing good and bad. And he says, just don't eat from that tree. You can have anything else that you want, just don't eat from that one. And, and I think we could hear that, that story, especially thinking about wisdom, and go, well, wait a minute. Why wouldn't God want Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve to, ooh, Adam and Eve, that's, yeah. That's not making any statements there, all right. Why would he not want them to know about what's good and, and what's bad? Why would he not want them to, to know the difference? And, and I believe that he did. I believe that he was going to teach them, that, that this was going to be something that he continued to reveal to them and grow in them. But what he didn't want was for them to reach out and to take that on their own timing and their own terms. And of course, that's exactly what they do. I was reading a commentary about Proverbs. It was speaking about this story of Adam and Eve, and it said this. It said, God forbids them to eat that fruit, not because he's giving them an arbitrary rule to break so that one day he can send his son to die for sinners and save us from hell. No, he wants to teach humanity to depend on God for that knowledge instead of determining it for ourselves. We love to determine what is good and evil for ourselves, don't we? God determines what is good and what is evil. That is not for us to decide. James says there's two types of wisdom. He writes about this in, his, in, in James chapter 3. He, he says there is wisdom from above. This is God's wisdom. This is God's way of doing things. And then he says there's wisdom from below, which is what you and I think is how things should be done. In fact, he even goes on to say that some of that is demonic, which is uncomfortable to hear. But he's like, if you're not choosing God's wisdom and you're relying on your wisdom, it is evil. It is, dis it is demonic. It will disrupt things. It will break things. It will ruin things in your life life. And, and he says, you have to choose which wisdom you want to take from. Do you want to take from God's wisdom or do you want to be like Adam and Eve? We, we're presented in the same situation of Adam and Eve over, over and over. Will we trust God in his ways or will we take from our own, our own path, our own plan, our own desires? And, and if you're a, a pastor, you see this play out over and over again. Um, throughout ministry, what you see is somebody who says, okay, I know what God's word says about divorce. I, I, I know what God's intention is. I, I know that he wants marriages uh, to be strong and to happen. And, and I know that the marriage I'm in doesn't have any biblical grounds for divorce, but you don't understand the situation that I'm in. You don't understand that it's been difficult and it's been hard and that we were married young and, and this and that. And it's just we, just, we just live with each other, but we don't love each other. Like, you don't understand. And so, therefore, I know what God says, but I need to do this instead, right? I know what Jesus said about lust in the Sermon on the Mount. And I know that he said I shouldn't even look at a woman lustfully. But when I, when I look at pornography, it's okay because it doesn't actually hurt anybody, which... It does, by the way. That's a whole other sermon that we would talk about another time. But, it, it does. But, but we do these justifications of, I know what your word says, but this is different because you don't understand the stress I'm under. You don't understand the pressure. They didn't understand living in the world that we do. And so therefore, I do this thing, and, and, and it's okay. Uh, 
We say, I know what God's word says about giving and and finances and generosity. I know the pattern in the Old Testament of people who gave the tithe as an act of worship. I I see radical generosity in the New Testament church. I I see what they were doing, but you don't understand my finances. Right? It's different, and I've got these, these bills to pay, and you don't understand my family of origin, and, and we didn't have a lot of money, and so it's really scary for me to not have a bunch of savings, and so I, I don't give. I know what God's word says, but this is, this is what I'm doing over here. We, we preached about forgiveness a few weeks ago. I know what God's word says about forgiveness. I, I know Jesus, when he talks about it, he says, hey, if you've been forgiven and you want to be forgiven, how can you not forgive others? I know that Jesus hung on a cross and forgave those who were who were crucifying him, but you don't understand the people that have hurt me and, and, and what's happened, and, and I can't forgive them because it, it's really hard and it's really different. I know what God's word says, but, but my situation is different. Have I offended anybody yet? Do I need to keep going? Because I, I can find something for, for all of us. As, as we know what God's word says, we know what the truth is, and, and then we find ourselves and we say, well, I don't know that that's really true for me. And here's the difficult thing about wisdom, is we have to let it saturate every area of our life. We have to let it in to every single area. Here's the danger. Sometimes people are wise in one area. Uh, let's say somebody, they own a business, they're really successful, they steward their money really, really well, they're generous with it, so they do everything they're supposed to in that area, and so they look wise, and they look successful, and they are in that area, but then what you find is, well, well, their marriage is in shambles, and, and their kids don't respect them, and there's these hidden things in their life that are, that are all kind of laying below the surface. And so uh, they're wise in one area, but they're just completely missing it and the rest of their life. It is possible for you to be wise in an area of your life and be completely stupid in another area of your life. It's a a danger for us. We have to let wisdom come into every area of our life. But here's the good news. The good news is wisdom is available for those who want it. It's there. Proverbs chapter 1, when it talks about lady wisdom, says that she is in the streets and she is calling out. She's not hidden. She's not far. This is not a treasure hunt. This is not complicated. Wisdom is there, and it is available if you want it. You you can just come, and you can take it. James, again, when he writes his letter, he says, if you do not have wisdom, ask God for it. Why? Because God wants you to have wisdom, and he's going to give you wisdom if you ask for wisdom in whatever situation or whatever part of your life that you need it in. Wisdom is there, and it is available for those who want it. The question for us is, do we want God's wisdom? Do we actually want to submit ourselves to his ways of doing things, his wisdom, and give up what we think is right and how we think we should handle situations and and what we think the path forward should be. And that can be a scary, scary situation to find ourselves in. But if we want that, if if we want to submit to God's way, if we want to learn from his wisdom, if we're ready to say, I am not the source of wisdom, then Proverbs is a great place to start. Uh, today we're going to read the first seven verses of Proverbs. I told you the first nine chapters is an introduction, and we're just going to read uh, the first seven verses because it's kind of a, a, a prologue. It's an intro to the intro. It tells us why we have this book and what we should do with it today. So it starts off by telling us who wrote it. These are the Proverbs of Solomon, David's son, king of Israel. Uh, if you looked at the life of Solomon, we know that when he was a king, he was just incredibly wise and intelligent, and he wrote all these different sayings and all these different proverbs. It was in the thousands, and not all of them find their way into this book because there's not enough in the book of Proverbs that we have for, for everything that he wrote down. But, but probably what happened over time is, is somebody took all these from Solomon. There's also some proverbs from other people, and they collected them, and they edited them, and they put them into the book of Proverbs that you and I have 
today. And then I'm reading from the New Living Translation because when I was reading some other translations, I usually preach out of the English Standard Version. When I read the next few verses, it wasn't really English. Like, it wasn't a sentence. It was kind of just this run-on that didn't actually start or finish, I felt like, at any point. And so the New Living Translation is a little more thought for thought whenever they translate. And so they've put it into to actual sentences for us to help us understand what Solomon is saying here. He says, their purpose, talking about the Proverbs, is to teach people wisdom and discipline, to help them understand the insights of the wise. The, the purpose of the book of Proverbs is to teach you wisdom. We've talked about that word a lot, but what is wisdom? There's a lot of different definitions we could give to wisdom, but here's how I'm thinking about it when I talk about it today, is wisdom is doing the right thing at the right time for the right reasons. And when you do the right thing at the right time for the right reasons, you, you learn how to live life well <laughs> and do things well, and we've all been around somebody. We've all been in a situation when somebody does the right thing, but they do it at the wrong time. <laughs> They're kind of uh, oblivious to the situation, or they do the right thing, but they do it for the wrong reasons. And at that point, you might as well just do the wrong thing because it's just as destructive. And so we want to be people who know not only the right thing to do, but that we know when to do it and how to do it, and that we've submitted ourselves to the, the reason is because this is God's wisdom, and, and we're submitting ourselves to his ways and how he would have me to live. Because the book of Proverbs, it's not a law book, it's not a rule book, it's not do this, get this, do this. Do. It's here is wisdom for your life. And In fact, you will find Proverbs, if you spend time reading it, you will find Proverbs that, that seemingly contradict one another. They say opposite things. And you could go, what do I do with that, right? Does this mean that I should just throw the Bible out because the Bible contradicts itself and therefore it cannot be true? Or could it be that we look at it and say that this is wisdom that needs to be used in the right situation? And that when we apply it to the wrong situation, then we're not going to get the results that we want. And so we have to be people, just like me trying to teach my kids, we have to be people who are wise and discerning and know the right things to do at the right time. And we're doing it because we, are, we have God's wisdom that, that we're trying to instill into our lives. And so, again, their purpose, verse 3, is to teach people to live disciplined and successful lives. To help them do what is right, just, and fair. I want to live a disciplined and successful life. Now, here's the thing about the book of Proverbs is I don't believe that these are promises, meaning uh, that I don't believe that if you do this, then you always get this result. I, I believe that these are principles. I believe that this is how life works most of the time. <laughs> but we do live in a fallen and a broken world, and a lot of these Proverbs have to do with other people and their behaviors. And I think sometimes people, because they are not following God's uh, Proverbs and, and God's wisdom that it can throw us into difficult situations and, and harmful uh, situations. And, and the reason I can say all that is because if you look at the another wisdom book, so we have different wisdom books in Scripture. Everybody agrees Proverbs is one. Everybody uh, agrees that Psalms is one. Everybody agrees that the book of Job is one. And what is the story of Job? Except for a guy who is doing everything right. He is more righteous than anybody in the land. In fact, Job is so righteous, it says that he gets up in the morning and sometimes he, he offers sacrifices for his kids on behalf of his, of his kids just in case they sinned. He doesn't even know that they did anything wrong. He's like, Lord, in case they had one too many last night, here's a sacrifice just to make sure we're all covered, that everybody's good, right? He is, he is doing everything right. He is a wise Man, and yet what happens to Job is his life falls into shambles and it has nothing to do with his behavior. It has nothing to do with him not trusting God. And in fact, we see the wisdom and the faithfulness of Job through that story. But these are, these are how life usually goes. And uh, there's a, a guy named Ray Ortland. He's a, a scholar. And a lot of our spiritual formation team and a lot of our pastors are reading his work on the book of Proverbs. And so that may be something that you want to pick up and read. But this is, this is what he says. He says, the Hebrew noun proverb is related to a verb that means to represent, to be like. So a proverb is a little model of reality, 
a little verbal representation of some aspect of our daily lives. And by picking up a proverb and turning it over and over, looking at it from all angles, we can see something about our lives before we step out into the actual reality. The world says, live and learn. God is saying, learn and live. Isn't that a better way to go about life? Instead of, hey, let's go, go try some things out, make some mistakes, figure it out. Instead, well, what if we said, God, I want to I submit to your wisdom. and your, I know that I'm not the source of wisdom that you are, and so I want to learn how you think I should handle these situations. And we, we read them, and we study them, and then we find ourselves in one of these moments. And guess what? We know how we should handle this moment because we've already sat under the teaching of our Lord. We, we know the wisdom that he has in so we can step with confidence into these moments. We go on to verse 4. These proverbs will give insight to the simple, knowledge and discernment to the young. Let the wise listen to these proverbs and become even wiser. Let those with understanding receive guidance by exploring the meaning in these proverbs and parables, the words of the wise and their riddles. And then he gives the foundation for where our wisdom is from. Fear of the Lord is the foundation of true knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and discipline. Now notice who he says the Proverbs are for. He says they're for the simple, they're for the young, they're for the wise, they're for those who want to become even wiser. So basically what he's saying is Proverbs are for everybody. <laughs> It doesn't matter if you're young, it doesn't matter if you're old, it doesn't matter if, you're, if you've been smart in your life, it doesn't matter if you've been stupid in your life, there is something for you here to learn and to become wiser. And in fact, here's the irony of the book of Proverbs. The irony is for the wise, when they approach this book, it's an incredibly challenging book. Why? Because... They're submitting themselves, and they're saying, I am, I'm not the source of wisdom. God is. And so they come to these Proverbs, and they actually have to live them out, and they actually have to do what they say, and it's difficult, and it's hard, and it's not maybe the way they want to live and the things that they want to do. And so it's challenging, and, and it's a life of being shaped into the wisdom of God. But for the fool, the fool reads Proverbs and goes, yep, I already knew that. Right? And I got that figured out. That's not a problem at all. Right? Like, that was easy. Because they're not submitting themselves. that They think that they're the source of wisdom. And yeah, 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 I already knew these things. And, and instead, they need to have the posture of a learner. This is what Dominique Hernandez says. He says, recognizing that one needs guidance is considered to be wisdom in Proverbs. I met a lady between services today. She came up for prayer, and, and, and quickly it became apparent that she was in, in a pretty difficult situation, uh, some extent probably of her own doing and, and some of her own choices. Uh, she's not really been a follower of Jesus. And, and what was beautiful is she came down and she said, look, I don't have wisdom and I need it. And as, so we began to talk, and we said, okay, okay, here's what we need to do, and here's some next steps. And she said, I'll do whatever it is that I need to do. I'm ready for this to change in my life. Guess what she is? She's a wise person because she recognizes that she needs wisdom. She recognizes that she's tried it her way, that she's been the source of wisdom for a long time. It has not gotten her where she wants to be. And so now she's saying, okay, what does it look like for me to submit to the wisdom of God and said, and see what happens Whenever I trust him, see what happens whenever I say, okay, God, show me that you are true to your word and that when I do these things that you're going to show up and you're going to act in a powerful way. She's a wise person. So my hope would be is that you want to be wise people. I don't think anybody's sitting here going, no, I don't, I, don't, I don't care for that. I'd rather be stupid, right? I'd, I'd rather be a fool. Wisdom doesn't sound great to me. Uh, I think we want to be wise people. And so what does it look like to be a wise person. And, and, and here's what I think wise people have. I, I think wise people have the right information and the right application. 
But you have to have both of those things. That you have to recognize that your wisdom is from God, and then you actually have to do something with it. Whenever you read throughout Scripture, whenever God tells his people to listen, whenever it talks about his people hearing, whenever it talks about faith, all of it is tied to obedience. That when you know what God wants you to do, when you know who God is, then you have to live accordingly. These two things are not separated. We cannot distance them from each other. When you know what God expects of you, when you know when, how God tells you to live, then you have to live that way. You have to have the right information and you have to have the right application. Jesus, after he preaches the Sermon on the Mount, what he says is he gives us this picture. Maybe you've heard it before. He says, for, that, for those who hear this and those who obey it, those who apply it to their life, they're like a wise man who built his house on the rock and the storms came. And, and the troubles of life come, and, and yet their house is secure. Why? Because they've built it on the right foundation, on the wisdom of God. And then there's the foolish man. I won't sing the, the Sunday school song to you, I promise. Some of you, it's already in your head right now. But there's the foolish man. He hears from God. He, he hears the teachings of Jesus. He hears the wisdom. And yet he says, no, 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 I'm going to do it my way. He builds upon sand, and storms come. And the waves come and life comes and his house comes crashing down. We have to have the right information and the right application. And so that requires us to have the posture of a student, to be somebody who says, there's something here that I can learn. There, there, there are things that I do not know that I need to know. Uh, I don't know if you've ever spent time with somebody who, uh, they just have answers to everything. Right? They just know everything, and they, they could tell everybody what they're doing wrong, and if everybody would just listen to them, everything would be right. I love when people tell me, you know what the problem with whatever is? And I'm always like, it's just one problem. Like, if you just fix that one thing, it's all better, and nobody else knows this. Like, there are people who just, they know everything, right? I, I've had times when I sit at lunch with somebody, or you know, I have a meeting with somebody, and, and I leave, and they've just talked the whole time, and they've told me everything that we should do, or everything that is wrong, and everything that we should fix, and I just leave going, man, that person just missed it, right? They never stopped and asked a question. They never stopped and said, hey, what do you think about this, or, or what could I learn about this? There was a, a podcast that was popular last year. It was about this large church that that had a pastor who made some poor leadership decisions, some poor uh, just personal and, and kind of moral decisions and everything imploded. Uh, but one of the, the things that stuck out is they were talking about him. And as his church grew, one of the things he said was, I cannot learn from a pastor whose church is smaller than mine. What a stupid thing to say. I grew up in, in a wonderful church of about 100 people, and I guarantee you there are some pastors that that guy could have sat under and said, teach me how to love my people. Teach me how to love the people that God has brought to me. There are some, there are some pastors of smaller churches that he could sit under and say, teach me what your prayer life looks like, because I guarantee there are some pastors out there who have rich, deep prayer lives that he could have benefited from. You are a fool when you just say, let me tell you what to do. I have nothing here to learn. But of course, we have to learn from the right sources and the right places. And we live in a time and an age that is full of gurus and thought leaders and content creators and people with a microphone who just think that they need to tell us every way in which we should live, right? And again, these are people who maybe they're wise in one area. They were good at their business. Maybe they're a good parent or whatever. And so then all of a sudden, they're just giving you advice about every single area of your life, and they're not wise in every single area of your life. And so all of a sudden, information just comes at us all of the time. Like, if you start looking at how much data is uploaded and content and hours of podcasts and hours of YouTube. Like, it is overwhelming how much information is coming at you. And we have to be people that, that say, well, what do I actually want to take in? I find myself sometimes with, with uh, I, I love podcasts, and I'll just go to my list of podcasts that I'm subscribed to, and I'm like, unsubscribe, 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 because it, it feels like I'm just getting blasted with so much information, and I can't learn from all this, and I can't apply all this, I can't even listen to all these episodes, and I just have to, I have to get rid of some of it so that I can get back to what is it that I actually should be paying attention to. My son last week he asked me an important question. He said, hey, Dad, will you get out the Super Nintendo, please? Because I have a Super Nintendo. It usually lives in a tote uh, in my closet. And even though my son has an iPad to play on and we have 
you know, Chromebooks and computers and stuff, he, he values 1990s video game technology, and he wants to play on the Super Nintendo, and so I got it out, and we hooked it up, and he plays Zelda and different games, but he, he loves maybe the greatest cartridge of all time, which is Super Mario Brothers All-Stars. Okay, some of you know, some of you are really confused right now, but basically it has the first three Marios on it and then some lost levels and some other stuff. And, and so you can play the, they've cleaned them up and they look a little bit better, but you can play the original Mario on Super Nintendo. And so it's hilarious to watch my kids play this, right? My kids play more complicated games with items and checkpoints and all these buttons and all these controls and all stuff. And all they have to do in Mario is just run and jump. That's just the whole game. It's a couple buttons. You just run and jump. And my son was just running and he jumped and just straight into a pit. And he goes, oh, why aren't there wall jumps in this game? And I was like, are there wall jumps in other Marvels? He's like, yeah, you can do this and this. And I'm like, bro, this is like, you just run and you just jump. But there is something about the simplicity of Mario that is so hard. <laughs> That's so difficult. And what my kids don't get is they don't get the years of pain and struggle. <laughs> Thank you. That my brothers and I... Now, we went through playing on a 13-inch TV in a bedroom, and when we get it, my brother was over last week, and when we get it out, and we get to World 8 in like two minutes, that's not an accident. That's years of practicing the right things, okay? Why am I talking about Mario? Because, yeah, dedication, and there is, there is something about coming back to the this, this simplicity, Saying, I want all the other noise gone. I just want to say, what, what is it that God says? What is, what is his wisdom for my life? There's one more Ray Ortland quote that I want to read for you. He says, the book of Proverbs is a gospel book because it's part of the Bible. And that means the book of Proverbs is good news for bad people. That's you and me. It's about grace for sinners. It's about hope for failures. It's about wisdom for idiots. This book is Jesus himself coming to us as our counselor, as our sage, as our life coach. The Lord Jesus Christ is a competent thinker for all times and all cultures. Wrap your head around that for a moment. He's a genius. And he freely offers us, even us, his unique wisdom. Jesus is our priest and our prophet. But in the book of Proverbs, we encounter Jesus as our mentor. Do you see him that way? You can have him that way. The universe's greatest expert on you. He alone is qualified to have that kind of say in your life. Jesus as a mentor. I don't know if you have a mentor in your life. I have some people in my life who I look up to who are further ahead and following Jesus, and they're so beneficial, and they're so helpful. One of them, he will send me a text message every single Sunday morning praying for me and giving me a thought about the day, and it's so helpful, and it's so good, and I look forward to it. And just think about Jesus being in the seat of saying, hey, hey, how should I handle this situation, Jesus? Hey, hey, what should I do? And he has given us this gift of wisdom. You know, what's fascinating about Jesus is, is there's one verse that tells us what he did between the age of 12 and the age of 30. And it says, Jesus drew in wisdom, stature, and favor with God and man. It's in Luke chapter 2, verse 52. And I don't understand all the implications of the incarnation and God becoming flesh, but evidently part of that process was Jesus leaving wisdom behind because he spent years growing in wisdom. And he knows how to teach you wisdom. Paul, when he talks about the resurrected Jesus in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he says Jesus is the wisdom of God. Not Jesus has the wisdom of God. Not Jesus knows or learns that he is. He is the embodiment of the wisdom of God. And that wisdom is available to you. If you choose to say, I'm not the source of wisdom, that, that I want the wisdom that is calling out to me. It is there and is it available to you. And so here's what I want to encourage you to do for the summer. Summer's a different time of the year. It's a different pace. And, and here's what I ask you to do. Just don't check out this summer. If you have vacation planned, go do vacation. That's awesome. If you have something to do with your family, go do that. Just come back, okay? <laughs> like, 
And don't just come back for a service, but, but be leaned in and be reading the book of Proverbs. That way when you come, you're, you're kind of primed and you're ready for whatever is taught up here in the next 10 weeks as we journey through this book together. And for some of you, you just need to say, I'm gonna, you've never read the book of Proverbs. And you need to say, I'm going to read through the entire book this summer. That's my goal. For some of you. Maybe you need to read it multiple times. I sat down the other day, and I just read the first nine chapters. Just, okay, what is it that you say in this introduction? Maybe you need to spend some time doing that. Uh, maybe that you need to pick out some Proverbs, and you need to say, I'm going to memorize these because I need this wisdom right now in my life. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to instill this in me. That way, when I come to that moment, that I make the right decisions. Billy Graham is famous for saying there's, there's 31 Proverbs and there's, you know, our months at most have 31 days. And so whatever the date is, he would read that, that chapter of Proverbs that day. Maybe you need to do that. But lean in and say, God, I want your wisdom. It's available. It's right here. It's for you. You just have to choose to accept it and, and to be shaped and to be formed into his wisdom. Let me pray for you. Father, you are good and you're a generous God. And I know that because you give us gifts like the book of Proverbs. You give us your wisdom. You give Jesus who says he will never leave us. He will never forsake us. He is with us to the end of the age and we'll be with him for eternity. And so, Father, right here and right now, make us into wiser people who submit ourselves to your ways and not our ways who trust you for the outcomes and don't try to control it ourselves. Father, for those who have built their life on your principles and your ways, I just pray that this season they would go deeper into what you have for them. Father, would you reveal new things to them? Would you, would you show them things in a new light? Uh, Father, for those who have done it on their own, they've Maybe they've never spent time in Scripture. Maybe it's been a long time. Maybe, maybe they don't know anything about the book of Proverbs. I, I pray that as somebody grasping around in the, in the darkness, that this would be a light to them, a starting place for them to experience your wisdom and your goodness and all that you have for them. We thank you for Jesus. It's in his mighty and his powerful name we pray. Amen.